Well, I do want to appreciate you inviting me here today to talk. Um, I'm actually in Bismarck. The uh, Burley County has their um, soil health workshop today as well, and so I was down there this morning. Um, so today I'm going to talk about nutritional quality of some of these selected annual forages using cover crops. And what I want to, what I want to show you is some of the work we've done over the last four years where we did look at livestock performance and we did have nutritional quality analysis done on a number of these plant species. Um, some of these plants would have been planted as monocultures um, or that have been planted within a cover crop or cocktail mix. And so what I want to do is show you a little bit about the quality you're looking at and where they fit. One thing I should remind you is that most of the data I'm going to show you is, was designed or is designed for late season fall grazing. So most of these would have been seeded in late June or July uh, with the idea of getting about 60 to 70 days of growth before we graze it. So the quality is really designed to provide a high quality feed for late in the growing season. Um, so if you have any questions, I don't know, Carl, if this will work, if you have any questions, just jump in. Um, otherwise, I'll go to the PowerPoint and you can follow along with me. Can you all see it fine? I'll take that as a yes. Um, What we did on, on uh, the study sites, we had a study area near Central Grasslands Research Station near Streeter, and a second one, we did a one-year study up by Milo, north and uh, west of Kandu. Uh, the Streeter study site, we looked at eight different forage types, either planted as a single crop or as a cocktail mixture crop. And we did compare most of our data on uh, Streeter is compared with native range. Remember, the philosophy on this is we are going to graze these crops from mid-October to mid-December. I'm not going to show you the results of, the, of that part of the study today. I'm going to concentrate on the nutritional status. We looked at some warm season crops. They were all seeded in early to late July. We had some spring seeded cereals. They were seeded in mid to late July. We did look at the brassicas. Uh, they were seeded in mid to late July. And we looked at a number of combinations of legumes. If you look at some of the uh, recommendations, where, especially with NRCS's funding, some of these cover crop mixes, they all require legumes in their cocktail mixes. Uh, we do struggle with legumes in our trials. We have a tough time getting legumes established with any kind of uh, production value late in the season. I'll show you those numbers as we go through. Um, at Milo, we did a one-year study with the county agent in Candu. That was Crystal Martin, Martin, Martindom. Um, we looked at 16 different annual forages plus two separate cocktail mixes. We looked at four warm season annuals eight cool season annuals, and four legumes. We had the same type of combinations here that we saw at Streeter, with the exception we added some winter cereals in this. And these were, these were planted anywhere from mid-May for the cereals to mid-July for, uh, for the brassicas. And the winter cereals were seeded in early August. Um, what I want to show you first is the forage production and costs. We can talk about nutritional status of many of these plant species, but you need to understand what the production potential is, as well as what the costs are uh, when dealing with these plants. And some of these plants can get very expensive to establish, especially if the production is low. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the production and cost values to start with. If you look at, I'm going to show you the Milo data here, and we looked at, at, at 16 different species. This graph shows you the, the, the warm season grasses. You have foxtail millet is the top one, then you have a sorghum sedan brown midrib which is your second one. The third one is a foxtail millet German, and then with sedan, sedan grass, which is piper. The bottom three are all spring cereals. We looked at oats, barley, and triticale. The second column shows you the pounds of production per acre. The third column shows you seed costs per acre. And the last col column gives you the, seed, the, the, the value of the seed cost to produce 100 pounds of forage. I would have done it by the pound, but then the numbers are pretty small, so I put it at a scale of 100 pound. The most productive annual that we had in this trial was sorghum sedan, which is not unexpected. It produced about four ton an acre. Um, it was actually a cheap uh, grass to, to establish in terms of seed costs. If you assume when we look at seed costs, that your input cost should be the same no matter what you're planting. So we'll look across the board at seed cost. It costs us 15 cents to produce 100 pounds of forage for the sorghum sedan. Our cheapest mix, our cheapest species, was foxtail millet Siberian at just under three ton an acre at 12 cents per 100 pound. All of our grasses were fairly economical. Um, one thing that'll stick out here, of course, if you're looking for a cheap mix that gives you the greatest amount of biomass produced 
on this trial was the sorghum sedan brown midrib variety or plant species. If you look at our cereals, um, you know, we've been, the forage barleys and triticales have been popular the last few years, but you'll see they're not the cheapest by far uh, plant to, to incorporate into a mix. You're looking at the production across the oats, the barley, triticale were virtually the same, give or take 5,000 pounds. Um, but you can look at the seed cost on the barley and triticale at $35 an acre versus $9.5 for the oats. So you're looking at a seed cost per 100 pounds of 21 cents for the oat, where you're looking at a 65 to 70 cents for the barley and triticale. It's a little tough to pencil out the barley and triticale in this trial. We found very similar results at Streeter when we looked at barley and triticale. Um, those two just right now seem to be a little bit too expensive. You don't get the bang for your buck on those two species. If you look at, um, at our legumes at Milo, we looked at four different legumes. We looked at a forage soybean, a hairy vetch, field peas, and cow peas. And if any of you have been in the cover crop business the last few years, you'll notice that one of the more popular ones that's been pushed are the cow peas. We've tested cow peas two years in, this study, in these studies. It is by far the most expensive legume in a mix, and it gives you the least amount of production among all the legumes. I, I have a, I'm struggling with the cow pea in these cocktail mixes. It's very hard to pencil it out. You look at it, it costs us almost $12 per 100 pounds of forage produced for the cow pea in this trial. By far the most cost-effective legume is the forage soybean. It's an expensive legume at 50 bucks an acre, but we produce slightly under three ton an acre at 85 cents per 100 pounds. We did test the forage soybean in 2010 at Streeter in our cocktail mix. And like most of our legumes, it was not very productive. When you see these warm season or these warm season legumes in particular, but even with the cool season legumes, when you see them in July in a mixture, they just don't do very well. Um, so the legumes are a little more expensive. The idea is to get some soil health benefits out of these legumes with nitrogen accumulation. However, if you're not producing the biomass, it's, it's just tough to, to, to do that in these, in these trials. So you'll see the cowpea sticks out as not a very cost-effective legume. The last slide shows our other annuals we looked at. The top two are our turnips. We looked at the Paja turnip, which is your forage turnip, and your purple top, which is basically your bulb-producing turnip. Uh, the forage turnip is a little more expensive for seed costs. Uh, in this trial, even though our forage turnip produced more biomass, there was no difference in terms of cost per 100 pounds of forage produced at 36, 36 cents. So, if, But if you're looking for a high producing variety, you always go with the Paja turnip because it's going to give you more above ground biomass to consume. The, the theory under the purple top, of course, is it produces a large turnip or large bulb that does give you divots in the soil. However, if you ever go to a turnip field the following spring, the turnips are virtually gone. They have a high nitrogen to carbon ratio. When they break down, there's hardly any carbon left and even that big turnip, when it's looking at a diameter of about a foot, there's not a whole lot left. And so the benefit that is perceived from the purple top, I think, is actually not there. I think you get more benefit from the pausia because the bulb is smaller, but it's more of a taproot. So you get a deeper soil profile uh, that, you're, that this root's going into. I don't have any data right now to show that. We're looking at that at Streeter right now, looking at the soil health benefits. <clears throat> but right now, it, uh, you know, I, I lean towards the pausia because it gives me more of a, of a viable feed source for the cows. If you look at our best cocktail mix, it was cocktail mix number one at 61 cents per 100 pounds. That mix was a turnip, radish, oats, millet, hairy vetch combination. If you look at our cocktail mix two, it was twice as expensive, and that's because we had cow pea in there, and we also went from oats to triticale. We doubled our cost, but had no difference in gain in terms of pounds produced. So when you look at these cocktail mixes, you need to be, it's critical to look at your costs on these so you don't get too expensive. Radish, of course, is the other popular brassica used in these cocktail mixes. Uh, produced by itself, about 1,700 pounds an acre. Costs about 20 bucks an acre if you do it by itself. And it comes about a buck 18 per 100 pounds. There's a reason we don't promote radishes as a, as a plant by itself. It costs you more. It's not as cost effective as the turnips. It makes a really nice addition to a cocktail mix because you're only putting a pound in, so your cost is low in the ratio, and you get that long tuber um, that gives you some punching through the soil profile 
If you need to have areas where you need to look at, at pans, trying to break through pans, the radishes work phenomenal in those scenarios. Our last two are our winter cereals, winter rye and winter triticale. Um, these, this data is a little deceiving because we only took the fall production off of it. Obviously, if you're going to look at the winter cereals, you want to use them the following spring. Um, we produced about 1,000 pounds in the winter rye and about 1,500 pounds for the winter triticale. If you're looking for a winter cereal strictly for fall use, the triticale or winter wheat are superior for production compared to the winter rye. It's true of most literature in the Northern Plains. If you're looking for something to carry over the following spring, for biomass produced, the winter rye is superior in terms of overall production for the two season. It will be the most cost effective among the two. You see 30 bucks an acre per acre, 30 bucks per acre versus 50 pounds. The trick with the rye is you have to understand the value of what you're going to put following that rye for a crop. Rye do have an allopathic chemical in the plant that can affect the growth of the following crop. You should not do a warm season, a warm season annual following winter rye, they don't do very well. Corn in particular, uh, even your sorghum sedans. In one of our trials, e even our turnips didn't grow real well following rye. So if you're going to go with certain species, you need to know when to ply, plant rye and when not to. Any questions on that? Because that's usually a common question I'll get on when to use which, which cereal for a winter cereal. OK, none t taken. I kind of highlighted these costs. The winter rye, winter triticale is about three to three dollars per hundred pounds if you just look at the winter, the, the fall use of it. The last set of data here on production is the stuff from Streeter. And this is an average of the four years of this study. Our foxtail millet is our most producing annual in a single crop system at about 4,000 pounds on the average. I should make a point that our, our Streeter trial is on marginal crop ground. It's basically a shallow to gravel, gravel soils with some slope. So they're designed to look at, at this crop ground that doesn't produce very good crops. We're looking at alternatives to get more money off, these, off this resource. The Milo study site was actually a really nice loamy soils, pretty good soil producing land. Um, our turnips produced on an average about 3,000 pounds. Uh, the difference was about 20 cents for the millet, 24 cents for the uh, turnips over the four years of this trial. Our cocktail mixes, because of the cost of the legumes, was almost twice as much, or it was twice as much of a cost compared to the annuals in this trial. What we've been trying to do over the years is try and cheapen up our cocktail mix to make it more cost effective for the producer while producing some kind of soil health benefits as well. And the struggle has always been the legume to put in there. You look at our native range, we averaged almost 3,000 pounds per acre on our native range in this trial. So from there, I want to look at nutritional status. And there's a series of slides. I'll go through the first series, and I kind of follow each other the same format. We look at our, at our nutritional status. Um, I'm going to show you two slides from Milo. And, and they're kind of noisy slides, but you should be able to, with the handout, to look at it. You'll see what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do here. What I'm showing you in this slide is the crude protein value of all of the species we looked at. And so your, t your left is percent crude protein value from 0 to 30 percent. The bottom is the species. Uh, that we looked at. And then the, the blue line is basically the minimum requirements of a 1,200-pound non-lactating cow as designed for that second trimester when she'd be grazing. And if you look here, those areas that are, uh, that are at the adequate level uh, would be your, millet, your warm season crops, your millet, your sedan grass, and sorghum sedan. As they cure out um, from a hard freeze, they tend to be kind of marginal to, to just above the requirements of a lactating cow. And in our trials at Streeter, we found that they were also the poorest in terms of livestock performance um, throughout the four years. They still, the cows still gained weight on the, on the warm seasons, just they didn't do quite as well in the cool, as compared to the cool season. If you look at our turnip, which is our next one there, uh, we're over 20% protein on our turnip on this trial. Our radish was about 18%. And then your legumes range anywhere from 20 to 25%. With the exception of the forage soybean, it's a little more fibrous. And that's at about 14%. And then you look at your winter cereals, they have phenomenal value for that late fall grazing at about 20%. To follow up on that, we didn't do energy at Milo, but we did do fiber content. And my, my blue line here is designed to show 30% fiber. And, and the reason I have that in there is, obviously, as you have a functioning rumen, you need to have enough fiber for that rumen to function properly. And one of the flaws of the brassicas is they're very high in water. 
They may be high in nutrition, but they don't have a lot of fiber. And so you're going to have to supply fiber to these species, or you're going to have some, some digestive problems with these cows. Uh, you'll see the, the fecal tissue will be very loose and runny. And it's something that we t recommend if you have turnips by themselves to provide a straw-based diet with it. And I'll show you some of the data on the turnips in the next slides here. The other ones that tend to be low in fiber are those winter cereals for fall use. You see we're looking at about 27% fiber content on winter rye and triticale. And so you could have some issues with bloat as well. Um, but they're kind of marginal for fiber content and just, just something you need to be careful with. And if you're, if you're feeding on, on a monoculture of these species, that you need to have some fiber with them. And these kind of point out in these slides, you'll see where they're kind of marginal for fiber content. And eventually, as they dry down, as, as, you free, as they freeze down, the dry matter does increase. And I'll show you on a slide a little later on the turnips in particular. So I want to start with the turnips. They tend to be the, one of the more popular annuals we're using today in our cocktail mixes. Uh, this is a picture of Purple Top to your left, Paja to your right. If you look at it from a roadside, they look the same. There's very little difference between the two turnips until you walk into the field. And there is a little bit of difference in the leaf structure. Um, the Paja turnip will have a much larger leaf than the Purple Top. And then, of course, if you look at the bulbs, they're quite different in terms of the size of the bulb. Purple Top gets its name because the bulb has a purple color at the surface, where the Paja color is always white or creamy in color. Here's some pictures of to your left is Purple Top, and to your right is Paja. If you just look at the base of the bulb itself, you can see how on the purple top, there's just not as big a foliage base on that turnip. So you can see it's putting a lot of energy to the bulb versus the paja. You can see the big leafy base on that paja turnip. It has a nice long tap root. Um, and that's, I, I prefer the paja over the purple top in a livestock grazing scenario. If you look at the uh, nutritional status of the turnip, this is an average of the four years at the Central Grasslands Research Station. Uh, this is, all my graphs look the same from now on. This is the crude protein graph. To your left is percent protein. To the bottom are the dates we collected, the, the, we collected every two, two weeks while the cows are on pasture. The blue bar will always represent the minimum requirements of a dry cow on an average 1,200 pounds during her second trimester. The gold bar will be the quality of the, gra of the plant. In terms of the turnips, you see the turnips maintain that quality throughout the grazing season, one of the few species that will not decline with, uh, as it senesces, because it doesn't senesce very well. It maintains leaf tissue very well throughout the season. We averaged about 14 to 15% from the 1st of October to the 1st of December for this plant. So you can see why it's popular in these mixes. It provides a high quality feed source for these livestock. If you look at energy content, um, this is a very high energy plant. We're looking at 85 to 90 percent energy. Um, this is in vitro dry matter digestibility. Very high nutrition. It's very similar to corn when we start in terms of 90 percent in the first part of October. So you'd expect these cows to gain weight on turnips. And on our trials over the four years of our study, our cows typically gain two to two and a half pounds a day on these turnips. And they, it wouldn't be uncommon to see over a 60-day period for them to gain 100 to 150 pounds and put on a full condition or condition score on this trial. Now, 2010 was a little bit odd in that we had a lot of snow from about the 1st of November on. And our cows did not perform as well in 2010. We only averaged about a pound a day gain in 2010. They still gained condition, about a half a condition score. But they, they di didn't do as well as 09, as 07 through 09. Um, so you're going to have to deal with these weather conditions in some of these scenarios. If you look at, at calcium to phosphorus, and these slides might be a little difficult to read, so I'm going to kind of clarify them for you. You still have your left side as your, as your percent composition, your dates to the bottom. The gold bar is calcium, and the top bar is actually the calcium content. The bottom dotted bar is the minimum requirements of a dry cow. The pink bar is phosphorus, so the solid line is the phosphorus content. And the dotted line, which is very close to the minimum requirements, or the gold one, is the minimum requirements for phosphorus. The brassicas are extremely high in calcium, at almost 3.5% calcium throughout the whole grazing season. That's, a tremendous, that's even higher than most of our legumes will ever, ever achieve. 
if you look at the minimum requirements, it's 0.15. So it's a very high quality in terms of calcium. It's also produces about 0.4 to 0.5 percent phosphorus in the diet, and we're almost twofold what the requirements are for these cows. So the calcium to phosphorus, I was a little bit worried about the calcium to phosphorus ratio on, this, on these plants, but it's still about eight to one ratio. So we're in a nice safe range, what I call the upper end range for calcium to phosphorus ratio. As we look at, at the turnips, this is one of the few ones that you need to deal with this fiber issue. And what this gra graph shows you is the foliage composition and the, the root composition of the turnips. And to your left, you'll see the foliage composition of purple top. Over the two years of the study, averaged about 30% of its growth occurs above ground, which means on an average, 70% of this plant puts its energy to bulb production. If you look at the pasha, on an average, it's 60 to 70 percent of its growth is above ground. So 30 to 40 percent is put its energy towards the bulb. So you can see it does produce most of its energy above ground. If you look at to your right, is um, is the dry matter composition of the foliage. So you have zero to 70 percent dry matter. On October 4th, for the two years, our dry matter was 18 percent to start. That's extremely low for a, 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 a single diet for these cows. By the third week in October, we're about 20%. And as we got a hard freeze, that dry matter increases dramatically. By the first week in November, we're at about 45%. And by the end of November, we're at 60% dry matter. And we, free, we feed free choice uh, <coughs> barley straw to these cows while they're on turnips. And they will eat a lot of straw for that first two weeks. By the mid-November, they graze very little of the straw. They feed on very little of the straw, and their, their diet is almost solely turnips. Um, so you can see the value of that. Whether you add a standing residue for them to graze, you need to add a residue or a, a fiber content for at least two weeks after a freeze. Then the dry matter is high enough where they're fine without it. So if, if you look at these numbers, this kind of just show. this is the 09 Purple Top versus Pasha. And you can see we produce about 45% more above ground foliage on the Paja versus the purple top. The big thing that NRCS was really high on was this, was this below, below ground biomass production. The purple top produced on, on our study is an average of 270% below ground biomass compared to the Paja. And so you can see why it was popular. I still think they're missing part of the point there in terms of that taproot from the Paja turnip. From there, I'm going I'm to talk about the radish. The radish is a very popular one used in the cocktail mixes. One thing about the turnips I didn't talk about, but you know, our turnips get about 60 days of growth before a hard freeze, and we never see any flowering on these turnips. However, the radish will start to flower at about 30 to 40 days. And you can see in this picture here, you've got a flower, a bolt of a flower. Usually occurs somewhere between four, around 40, 45 days. Um, so it starts to mature out. And of course, the popular part of the radish is, is the bulb, or this long carrot-like tuber, um, which grows about half of its growth is below ground, and about half of its growth is above ground. Um, if you ever have any, any white-tailed deer in your area, the white-tailed deer absolutely love the radish. And they will seek this out. They usually bite the top off, and then they graze that radish into the ground before they go to the next plant. Um, but it, it's a very popular one in the cocktail mixes. It's also very similar to the brassic to the turnips in terms of its nutritional status. Our protein value ranged from 14 to 18 percent across the growing season. Um, for some reason, the radish actually increased every year except for one across the growing season in terms of quality and well above the minimum requirements of a, of a dry cow. You look at the uh, dry matter digestibility, once again, very similar to the, to the turnip at about 85 to 90 percent in vitro dry matter digestibility. Uh, throughout the grazing season while we're, on, while we're on pasture here. And last is the calcium to phosphorus ratio. Both calcium and phosphorus were well above the, the requirements of a 1,200 of a pound dry cow. Um, the, cocktail, the calcium on the radish actually declines throughout the season from about 3.5 to 2% uh, of the plant material. And it was consistent across the years. Most plants, calcium actually increases as it matures. Radishes had actually declined. 
the, the one that we've been studying the longest is the foxtail millet. We actually had it in a swath grazing trial two years prior to, the, to our, our standing crop trial. Um, our standing crop trial, of course, is designed to look at single cropping versus dual cropping. And to your right is some cows grazing a standing crop millet. Uh, one of the flaws of these warm season crops is when they freeze down, they, the palatability declines dramatically, and we see a lot of waste on, these, on this plant. We, we actually give them about seven to nine days of grazing with a hot wire that we move every seven to nine days, Try, trying to minimize waste. And the cows really do pick through, this, through these millets. And we, on our first year that we actually tested this, we had about 40% waste of our millet in our trials compared to the turnips, we're at about 18% waste. Our cocktail mixes, we have about a 30% waste in the trials. If you look at crude protein value of foxtail millet, in our trials, foxtail millet, because it's not seeded till July, it heads out very close to freeze up. <coughs> Excuse me. And so it, the, the dry down material stays above 8% throughout the grazing season. It starts at about 10 to 12% in October on a really wet year. In the, long win in the long summer months, we've had it as high as 14% in the first part of October, and it does decline as it freezes down from 11% from on an average to about 8% on this trial. But we're still well above the minimum requirements of a 1,200-pound lactating cow. You look at energy, our energy starts on an average about 70% in October and declines to about the mid-50s by the first part of December, still above the requirements of a, of a dry cow. If you look at calcium and phosphorus, um, our calcium content, um, like most grasses, is quite a bit lower than, than, the, uh, than the brassicas, but still it ranges from 0.35 to 0.45% of the plant tissue, which is still well above the requirements of a cow. Um, like most grasses, though, our phosphorus become deficient. When we start the trial, it, the grass is still green, and our phosphorus ran about 2.27%. However, by, by mid-October, we're already below the minimum requirements of even a dry cow, and we maintain below the requirements throughout the rest of the grazing season into mid-December. Whether it pays to provide a supplement for that short of time period before they come into the lots is questionable. Uh, these cows can mobilize phosphorus for that short time period, but just as something to know, you will be deficient. So if your cows come into these systems deficient, um, you might have some long-term problems with phosphorus deficiencies. And we'll let Carl talk about that later if we want to talk about deficiencies and how that affects the cows. Right, Carl? Yes, sir. Not a problem. If we look at the sorghum sedan hybrids, we added the sorghum sedan, the brown midribs, in 2008, primarily because I figured I could get more production or more bang from my buck compared to the millet. So we added this in our cocktail mixes to give us a more producing, a higher producing grass that should be more palatable, late and also give me more, high, more quality. Uh, because it's in the cocktail mix, um, I, I can't tell if we're getting a better use of it. It appears the cows are grazing it more readily than when we had the millets in there. Um, but the brown midribs do give you a higher palatable plant. Uh, so I'll show you what we have for numbers. And if you look at the quality, it does stand true from what we saw, what you see in the, in the, in the research on the brown midribs. Our quality runs from anywhere from 12 to 14% protein compared to the 8 to 11% on the millets. Um, so we did get a, a higher quality diet here for the cows. Uh, in reality, they both met the requirements of the cow, so whether we gained it or not is, is kind of questionable. But the costs were very similar in terms of pound produced to the cost that it costs to put it in. If you look at, at digestibility, it's much more superior to the millets in terms of digestibility, starting at 80% in October to about 72% by December 2nd. Remember the millets, they were already at 70% in October and dropped down to the mid-50s by the first part of December. So it did, it did achieve that objective of up, providing a higher quality diet. If you look at the calcium to phosphorus, uh, the sorghum sedan did give us a higher phosphorus content, and we always were above the minimum requirements over the two years of our study, or actually three years of data uh, in, the, in the street or trial. Also, our calcium content was quite a bit higher. And you got to remember this is on the same ground, so, so this plant is, is scavenging calcium better than the millet did uh, from, the, from these soils, and it's also doing better on the phosphorus than the millet did as well. And, and millets are known to be pretty good scavengers 
for, for nutrients, but I, I don't know if, it's, it, if that's as true when it comes to the minerals. It might be probably better, obviously, with the nitrogen, but the minerals, they don't do quite as, better, as good as the sorghum sedans. Um, before I go on the legumes, I forgot to put in the data sets on the cereals, which would be our oats, triticale, and barley. I finished this talk about midnight last night. Um, and so if you look at the cereals, and, and, and we have a report that will be in the Central Grasslands Research Station um, annual winter handout, which is going to be next week. And we have those in, in there for the cereals. Our cereals, since they're planted in July, always were high in nutritional value. They run about 10 to 12 percent protein and about 60 to 70 percent digestibility um, throughout the grazing season. So, and I apologize for that. I could have, should have had them in here. Um, but they do make a nice, obviously a nice mix to put in these cocktail mixes. The one we've been going to lately is strictly an oat, and that's strictly a function of cost. It's by far cheaper than triticale and barley, and it gives me a greater return uh, on my cows in terms of a daily daily cost to feed these cows. If you look at the uh, the legumes, Kevin, Kevin, yes. I got a question here before we go on. Yes, this is Tim up in Bodno. On the sorghum sedan grass crosses, uh, how did you manage the prussic acid concerns uh, after the frost? Uh, was that a was that a problem? Uh, did you let the stuff dry down before you graze it? Uh, what what did you do with that? It's a good question. I've been asked that question because we use that. You know, we never let it dry down, and in, and in fact, we're grazing by mid-October, and in, in two of the years, they, it was still green when they went to pasture, um, but the sorghum sedan is seeded at four pounds an acre in the cocktail mix, so it makes up about 15% of the plant composition, and we have never had a problem with prussic acid toxicity, and in fact, what we've found is, is the cows actually don't select for that first. They will select for, if you have oats in the mix and the oats will be headed out, they will select for the oats first. They will then graze the turnips and they will select, they will, they will, they will take parts of the sorghum sedan. And so we, we, we thought about that. We've, we've never had any problems with the sorghum sedan. When it freezes down, I've always been, been a cautionary when you freeze down, you can get a higher concentration in the plant tissue. But... The plants are about two, they're at least two feet tall, Tim, before they go on pasture. And usually the recommendation on the sorghum sedans for prussic acid is two feet or more. And my, my gut feeling is without having tested is my prussic acid is probably low enough anyway that I don't have a, a toxic level. And that's a great question. I think I might do in 2011 is actually test the sorghum sedan for a le, uh, the level of prussic acid. And, and if, if a producer called me and asked me about that, I would, I would answer it the same way. I would say be cautionary of the prussic acid potential, or at least to make sure you got two, weeks, two feet of growth. Um, but we've been, we've been, over the three years, we haven't had any issues with it. And we grade so on an might, average. Oh, go on, Tim. Oh, it might very well be then, because it's incorporated in a mix, that due to the selectivity of the grazing of the cows, that they're going to the other stuff first, and by the time they graze... Uh, a frosted uh, prussic acid plant, it might have well have kind of dried down and cured out, so to speak. Yeah, although the, you know, they're, they're, they're forced to consume you know, seven to nine days, so they'll have consumed sorghum sedan in that first week uh, because they'll, they'll cons consume all of that. I, we haven't consumed, try to consume 80% of the biomass. Then we move the fence. So they would have grazed the sorghum sedan in that first week. I think the difference is, is the level that their consumption at any given time is, is small. Um, compared to the rest of their diet. And so it, it's obviously being diluted down to some level. Even if it was high, um, the consumption probably dilutes it down. I don't, I'm guessing here, Tim, to some level. But we've never seen even symptoms of it in the cows. Um, but those are all good, good questions to ask and, and concern questions. And you know, the literature also on the brown midribs is they tend to be lower in terms of prussic acid as the older sorghum sedans as well. So, but I think, I think next year, Tim, I think we'll do that. We'll test those sorghum sedans to see what our level is. For us to walk from our studio to Thanks for the question. We have to walk through security. So if we look at our, our legumes, uh, this is cow peas. It's, it's a winter annual warm season legume. Um, very popular in NRCS's mixes. It is also our poorest quality legume, bar none of all the legumes we've tested. Um, of course, when it's green, 
its quality is about 15%, but when that dries down, it, the quality crashes. We're looking at about 7% by the late part of October and about 6.5% by the end of November. It was our lowest quality legume in the trial. If you look at digestibility, digestibility becomes borderline by the end of October, and it actually can become deficient late in the season on the clipping trial. But it is very highly nutritious while it's green. So if you're looking at planting these legumes and you're going to graze the cowpea, obviously during the growing season, this would not be a concern. But if you're looking at a legume to graze late after a hard freeze, this would not be a choice that I would select for. If you look at calcium to phosphorus ratio, like most of our, our legumes are going to be adequate to, to quite efficient in terms of the calcium and phosphorus. Both levels were above the minimum requirements throughout the grazing season. Probably one of the more popular legumes used in the cocktail mixes today is the hairy vetch. Uh, this is a, a cool season legume, annual cool season legume. Oftentimes used in spring mixtures as well. Um, the beauty of hairy vetch is it regrows nice, so if you can take a harvest on it in a hay crop, it'll regrow in your cocktail mix or your mix, and you can use it for late in the season. The picture to your left is obviously a, a hairy vetch planted with a wheat, and to your bottom, I believe, it's hairy vetch planted with oats. Uh, if you look at the nutritional status of hairy vetch, it's by far superior to the cow pea, 18% uh, in the 1st of October to almost 13% in the end of November, well above the requirements of a lactating cow. Um, there are trials that show hairy vetch will actually, can actually be, you'll also see it come back the following spring as well, and some of these depending on how it's utilized. If you look at the digestibility, it averaged give or take about 70% throughout the grazing season. Um, you'll see most of these legumes we used once in our trials. The reason for it was we were trying to find a legume that would fit. Uh, the cow peas and regular soybeans were a bust in 07. In 08, we used red clover. I didn't show you today because the red clover was almost was also a bust. It was cheap, but it didn't produce a lot of biomass. It became a weed the second year of our trial. Of course, Harry Vetch would use it in 09, and that probably was our best option. In 2010, we actually used forage soybean. Based on the results from Milo, it appears to be the superior producing legume, but like most warm seasons, it didn't do very well in our cocktail mixes when they were seeded in July. I didn't show you the, the forage soybean data, but it was very similar to the hairy vetch in terms of quality. If you look at calcium, calcium was high in the hairy vetch, and it did decline dramatically throughout the season. <coughs> of course, phosphorus was very similar at 0.3 to 0.35 uh, throughout the season in 2009. Uh, the last one, what we did is compared with native range. So we grazed these cows from mid-October to mid-December on native range as well. And this was na typical native range in the Coteau around the Central Grassland Research Station. It's very heavy, Kentucky bluegrass or June grass dominant. So when we have some long winter or long falls, cows have a very high nutritious diet um, until it freezes down. And I'm going to show you the quality numbers here, but one thing we did see on this trial is the cows did very well on native range in 2007, 2008, and 2009. They averaged over two pounds a day gain also in, in, the, in this treatment. In 2010, they were digging through snow a lot more, but they still gained about three quarters of a pound a day on native range. The one treatment that was really a bust in 2010 because of the snow was the foxtail millet. Our cows actually lost, on an average, a third a pound a day and lost over three quarters of a condition score in 2010 with the foxtail millet. And so that it, was, it became risky when we had a lot of snowfall. Our cocktail mix did probably the best among all of them in terms of nutritional performance in 2010 because it gave us a better diversity of diet in 2010. But it, it was, native range didn't do too bad as well. However, if you look at the quality of native range, and this is a flaw of, of clipping data, um, minimum requirements, as you can see in the blue bar, crude protein value of native range was adequate when we started the trial and became one and almost two points deficient in terms of protein. However, the cows gained weight on these treatments, which tells you the cows um, are selecting for the green and I'm, uh, picking around, obviously, the drier, the, the browner tissue. No, it's too late for that now. Okay. Dave, Dave, could you mute your 
Thanks, uh, Kevin. I, I was on the phone to Linda McCaw to try to get Dave to mute or somebody to mute that microphone. Hopefully okay. they'll do it. If you look at the percent, uh, the disability of native range, once again, it was deficient by the first week of the trial and stayed deficient throughout the season. And traditionally, we, we, would, we would typically say native range was not, is not going to provide a high enough quality diet throughout much of the season. But in our trials, the cows actually did pretty good. And last, uh, calcium is actually usually quite adequate for native range at 0.4 to 0.5. But if you see phosphorus here, phosphorus is quite deficient on native range. And that's true of most of the second half of the grazing season for native range. In our trials, we were already probably 30% deficient by the 1st of October and probably 100% deficient by the end of November. And so phosphorus deficiency will be an issue on native range. I got just, I'm going to end my talk with showing you some pictures of single and dual cropping. Uh, in 2008, to your left, this is a turnip treatment. And to your right is our uh, dual cropping uh, system, spores, which is uh, yeah. forge barley with the turnips planted into them. Okay. And what we found in our trials, if you, if you do a dual cropping system and you don't burn down that foxtail barley or your oats, germination is poor and success is terrible. Uh, we produce about 10% of the biomass that we would have on the single cropping system. Um, so what we have figured out by 2008 is we have to burn down that crop once we harvest it. If you look at this picture. This picture shows you uh, the, the fence line there. On both sides would be the oat crop in 2009. Um, and the green part is where we sprayed Roundup. And obviously the brown part is where we did not spray Roundup. And we, we did get a catch, of course, of the crop when we burned it down. And actually in 2010, where we had an adequate moisture supply, our, uh, our dual cropping system, our production on our second crop, or our cover crop, was almost as good as a single cropping by itself, which made it very cost effective as a dual cropping system. But, the, but, the, but my point on the dual cropping system is if you don't have any moisture and your, route, your ground is marginal, it is very risky to put a second crop on there because you're not going to get the return. And if you do, you, you, you need to spray that down so you kill that first crop or it will take the rest of the moisture out of that profile and you're going to have a poor, poor germination of that crop. So from there, I can open it up for any questions if I have time. Are there any questions for Kevin? Yes. Yeah. Please, we got a question here, Kevin, at the Carrington RE Center. Kevin, did you notice any problems with volunteers the following year in certain crops, or do I just suck at farming and don't know how to farm? No, I'm sorry, I can't get my picture, my, my face up here, but the only volunteer we had was the red clover. <laughs> Does Harry Vetch, because that comes back, is that a problem? Harry Vetch will come back the following year. However, in our trial, you know, we consumed, we grazed that all off, and because you're sitting, it's fairly late. Uh, we didn't see any volunteer hairy vetch. The, well, I mean, we shouldn't say any, but it was less than 5% volunteer in the hairy vetch. The red clover, we had almost 100%, you know, volunteer the next year. But it's a biennial plant, so I expected that um, on my mix. Um, so the only volunteer we had was the, was the, the clover. Carry a to some small degree. The rest of the plants we had no, we had very little volunteer. We did have a little volunteer actually, surprisingly, of the foxtail millet, because it does go to seed, and we saw some foxtail millet the following year, but it was less than two percent. Got a question up here, Botno? Sure. sure. Yeah, I was just wondering if you've uh, looked at using malting barley in any of your mixes, and if you haven't, uh, why not? Just because it seems to be so much of a cheaper option than the forage barley? That's a great question. I absolutely agree with you. You know, we, we, we did the forage barley because the forage barleys, you know, were popular in the late 90s into the 2000s, and there was newer varieties released, and so we tested some of the forage bar barley varieties to see if the newer varieties were, were more effective. Um, but the cost is very prohibitive in my view, and I think if I'm going to put a barley in there, I would go with more of a traditional grain barley because your cost is much cheaper. And if you look at some of the literature on the grain barley versus the forage barley, there isn't much difference in terms of quality of the feed. However, the forage barley tends to be more productive, but it's only on an average about 15 to 20 percent. 
and it, it by no means covers the cost of the seed. So if I was going to go with the barley, economically wise, I would I would go with the more of a grain barley. <coughs> Good point. Any other questions? We have another question at Carrington, Kevin. Okay, just speak out loud. Oh, what seed mix would you recommend for trying to crop after barley for 2011? Did you hear that? I, I did not, Carl. Um, what? Can anybody? What seed mix would you recommend in 2011 to follow up after barley, Kevin? After a barley grain crop or a barley forage crop? Harvested for grain. Barley grain. Early, early August. When you, one thing I've noticed with when you're following an actual grain crop is your growing season is is shorter and it's cooler. And I have almost eliminated all warm season crops as options. Just because I don't know if, you can, if they can pay for themselves. So to, to me, a good mix following that would be a, a turnip, radish, oats. Um, combination with we put the sunflowers in all of ours because it's 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 cheap and it gives a nice little diversity in there. Um, but I would go with the brassicas. I'd go with oat or, or an oats because it's cheap. Um, a sunflower and if I'm going to put a legume in there, which I'm still struggling on trying to find the right legume, um, I would go with any kind of cheap legume that you can put in there if you want to put a legume in there. Um, anything else? I you know. To me, that would be my cheapest and most productive mix. If, if you want to go with the warm season, you know, I would probably go with the with a millet, especially the Siberian millet, because it requires the shortest growing degree days to to produce a, a, a pound of gain. It's about 50 days for the Siberian. It's about 70 days for the common, and then of course sorghum sedan is about 70 to 80 days. So if you want to put a warm season in there, it would be a foxtail millet, the Siberian variety, and it's cheap. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Kevin? <laughs>